Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I want to introduce, um, well, another speaker, <laughs> um, Benoit Dubé, who is Penn's Chief Wellness Officer. And um, we thought it was very fitting to have him kick off our series on well-being in the brain um, by talking about well-being, <laughs> maybe, and the brain too, I don't know. Um, I will just say that Benoit has been at Penn for quite a while, I don't know how long, and I don't wanna embarrass you by making you sound old, um, in the Department of Psychiatry, but um, in uh, late 2018, he was appointed Chief Wellness Officer at Penn. And you know what happened in late 2019, um, and then really got going in the US in early 2020. So um, this is, uh, you know, these are times that try chief wellness officers, um, but uh, we're really lucky to have Benoit leading the, you know, the drive to uh, keep students and staff and faculty and everybody else um, happy and healthy and in touch with their well-being. So without further ado, let me give you Benoit. Uh, thank you very much and welcome to all of you here um, and, and at home. So I am the Chief Wellness Officer and when I was invited to take this position, it was really never about viruses. <laughs> it was about mental health. He was about the multiple domains of wellness. He was about really being able to harness what we as a thriving academic community can do to add to our understanding to the science, the theory, and the practice of wellness and well being. We certainly have learned a lot of our strengths we didn't imagine, and we also uh, discovered vulnerabilities and blind spots but it was a shared experience and it really cemented the importance of supporting one another. So first taking care of ourselves, but also taking care of one another in the process. The Wellness at Penn initiative uh, was started three years ago and it was really to highlight how wellness is a core priority for this institution. And when we look back at what we've been able to accomplish how we've been able to continue to sustain our mission during these very challenging times. We should look back with pride in what we've been able to accomplish. It doesn't mean it was easy, but it means that we have come out of this and are coming out of this stronger and wiser. I think I'm contractually obligated to talk a ben, about Ben Franklin. <laughs> so uh, Ben Franklin reminded us that the most noble question is how can we do good in this world? And I would argue that seminars such as this, where we're able to share information and elevate our understanding of our own humanity, our vulnerabilities, but also fostering our strengths is one way to make this world a better place. The better we are taking care of one another and supporting one another, the better off we all are. We all benefit when we all do our part. The last thing I want to say, because I'm a psychiatrist, is masks are great for viruses. Masks are not great for emotions. Remember to take care of yourselves and one another. I'm very excited to be here for the inaugural lecture when we will learn about how social wellness, one of the eight domains, is actually based on science and how we can support it and do better. So thank you for the opportunity to kick off this the series and thank you, Dr. Barb and the center for putting this together. Talia, you're not you're not getting out of here without being <laughs> oh, oh sorry, sorry. <laughs> but it, it will be a very short yes. introduction. Um, I just want to um, announce in case it's not already been made obvious that our theme this year is well-being and the brain. And friendship, as Benoit said, is a, an essential 
part of well-being and an essential source of well-being. And, you know, I can't think of anybody in the world doing research on the neuroscience of friendship who is, you know, better able to explain it to us and, and be credited with the foundational research in it than Thalia. She did her undergrad at Harvard in political science. She, um, I read that she took a social science course thinking it would just be a really easy thing to add to her schedule. She found it extremely challenging, uh, but also extremely fascinating. And you know, the rest is kind of history, social science PhD, postdoc in a cognitive neuroscience lab, and then on to uh, Dartmouth and the Santa Fe Institute, which is definitely cool stuff, um, where she has been a pioneer of social neuroscience. So now, now you can find okay. it in your talk. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Can uh, is this coming through? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah. It's so great to be here. That number of old and new friends. Uh, as we've had a wonderful day so far. Um, so I'm talking about the neuroscience of friendship, and um, it's actually pretty uh, well established now that our know, friends are really important to us as a species. Um, actually, a lot of that work has been done by people at Penn, um, Michael, obviously there. And uh, even um, Robert Safarth with Baboons has shown that friendship, uh, the stability of friendship networks is incredibly important for physical and mental health. So this has been very well established. Friends are good for you in terms of well, you know, wellness, well-being. Um, but we wanted to uh, ask uh, a sort of more foundational question of why do people even become friends or what makes people friends? I think about the people that you're friends with. You're not friends with everybody in this room, for example, um, but you're friends with some of them, um, hopefully. Uh, and uh, what is it that makes some people become friends and um, some people not? So uh, why do people become friends is our question. And then we can get into maybe in the Q&A sort of why our, our brains work this way. Um, but I'll, I'll just start with this very simple question and introduce um, my collaborators. Uh, Carolyn Parkinson did some of this work as a PhD student with me. She's now an assistant professor at UCLA. Adam Kleinbaum, uh, a professor at Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth um, as well. So why do people become friends? This is a question that always makes me think of Ted Bundy, which is slightly <laughs> odd, because he is quoted as saying, I didn't know what made people want to be friends. I didn't know what made people attractive to one another. I didn't know what underlay social interactions. In part, one of the reasons he became a psych major, actually, at the University of Washington before he went on to do things that we know him to be famous for. So what is it that makes people become friends as opposed to just sort of all of us knowing each other in the yeah. same sort of way? And there's a conventional wisdom, of course, that we befriend people of a similar mind to ourselves. And um, this is an ancient, right? This is 15th century birds with feather flock together. Right? This goes back a very long way. And usually we think about people um, as sort of flocking together uh, based on demographics. So um, we've known for a long time now that people kind of associate with each other, or become friends with each other um, in the same age range and same gender, right? You start to see people sort of dress alike, et cetera. This is, um, this is me in London, and uh, I'm confused why this picture, why my friend's taking this picture, and, uh, and he said, you found your tribe. You know, it's like you found the people that look just like you. This is sort of what we tend to do when we make friends. We want to know whether there's something deeper there about uh, people befriending others of a similar mind that goes beyond these sort of course demographics. And so to ask this question, I needed a social network where I could be, I could know who's friends with whom and everything is very well contained. And, and basically that meant either like getting access to the show Survivor, where you've got basically people sort of shipwrecked on a, on a desert island together, 
or go to Hanover, New Hampshire, which is very, very well isolated. Uh, this is Penn, right? Here's Hanover, where I live, and it's absolutely beautiful, but there are very few people, and they sort of cluster together, and there aren't opportunities. Like here, you're in Philly, right? There's opportunities to go elsewhere outside of your network in your department. Uh, not so much here. So this is uh, this is actually the town of Hanover, for those of you who haven't been, and this is all of it. Um, there's like there's two coffee shops, there's like six restaurants, and uh, some dorms, basically. And in, in this little tiny section at the top here is the tech school. And they're even cloistered inside of Hanover, right? They have this set of buildings that are all interconnected. And uh, this is what it looks like. And they all study together. They take the same classes as a cohort together. They, uh, the dining halls are there where they eat and they sleep all in these interconnected little rooms, right? And they opt into this, right? They opt into this sort of immersive educational experience. So it's a great opportunity to have this kind of lockdown network to be able to study how, what, people, what people sort of gravitate towards each other, et cetera. And so what we do is, as part of their coursework, so 100% participation, is we ask everybody, um, Consider the people with whom you like to spend your free time. Since you arrived at Dartmouth, who are the classmates you've been with most often for informal social activities, such as going out to lunch, dinner, drinks, bills, visiting one's another's homes, and so on. So we ask them, we basically say, this is what it means to be a friend, okay? Now here's the roster, here's all 250 of your classmates. You check off which ones count by this definition of friendship. Very simple task called a friend nominator, and it's uh, uh, very robust. And then we can, because we've got 100% participation, we get this, right? We know exactly who's friends with whom in this network and who's, who are social hubs, who are social brokers. There's all sorts of ways we can analyze this data, but I'm going to be talking about friendship today. And so what we did was the, yeah, the orange dots are people actually that we took out of this network and we studied. And uh, just in, in case you haven't seen one of these sort of hairball social network graphs, basically what you're seeing is that if you've got uh, two dots that are connected by a single path, those people have nominated each other as they they both said each other's friends. It's one one path length. Those are friends. Sometimes you'll see people who are linked through an intermediary. So these people are friends of friends. And they aren't directly friends, but they're both friends with the same person that's friends with them. And uh, they're people who are friends of friends of friends and so forth. We can go even further out in the network. And very simply, what we did is we took these people uh, one at a time, and we put them in an fMRI scanner, and we showed them a bunch of movie clips. So these clips are about each so five to eight minutes long. There, there's some like music videos. There's um, various, various forms of comedy. Um, there's political, science, nature, all sorts of things. So they're lying in the skin. I'm going to show you uh, just a, a very brief, brief snippets of the kinds of things that they saw, just so you got a sense, so you can see the, the breadth of what we showed them. When I was outside on uh, my first spacewalk, I was on the dark side of the world over the Indian Ocean. By having workers who only had to do one thing, they could pay them a low wage, and it was very easy to find someone to replace them. The water squeezes out of the cloth, <laughs> and then because of the surface tension of the water, it uh, is insulting when a coach is making five to 10 to 15 times more than a college president. These babies are not strong enough to cling, and they fall to the ground repeatedly. It's at times like that you don't often think of funny things to say, but I did. And I turned to the rescue workers and I said, talk about a rough day at work. Talk. That was uh, <laughs> referring to the spending the time up there being pretty rough. <laughs> talk about a rough day at work. <laughs> right. So there's sort of this dry sort of documentary style humor, um, but also there was slapstick and, and various various things. 
And so everybody that does this study is just lying there alone looking at these things. They've never seen any of this before, you know, just watching. And then we uh, do a bunch of stuff with the brain data. Um, so we just we created uh, uh, 80 parcels of free surfer, uh, just sort of dividing up the brain into different pieces. And then we did something just the most mathematically simple thing you can do is just take the uh, the signal coming out of our region, it's averaged together over time, and you're basically just correlating pairwise across people over and over again. Um, so you want to see does you know does this part of my brain activate in the same way over time as your part of the brain when you see the same thing? Right. It's a very very simple straightforward thing to do. So this is sort of the idea. Water squeezes out of the cloth, and then because of the surface tension of the water, it's so you just get the brain activity during that and you correlate it pairwise across all these people. And here's here's the finding. Um, so this is 80 different chunks of the brain. You can't read any of those, I, I recognize. Just take my word for it, there are various areas. If you really care, you can come up later and, and look at all of these. Left hippocampus, whatever. But um, this is what we found. When you're looking at people who are friends of friends of friends, so these two people are separated by uh, three path lines. Their brain activity while they're watching these movie clips is somewhat surprisingly um, uh, dissimilar relative to the average of the population that we studied. Okay, um, if you go one path length in in the social network, they become more similar, and then friends are remarkably similar. Um, not in every brain area, right? There's some that go the other way, but remarkably similar across the brain. And it's not, we thought, oh, maybe we'll see like default mode network or something, maybe we'll see this or that. And it's uh, extremely widespread. We see that friends have more similar brain activity than people who are friends of friends, and those have more similar brain activity than friends of friends of friends. After that, it gets it gets sort of random because I mean, name a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, right? Uh, at that point, you don't really know these people. But interestingly, um, you know, people who are friends of friends of friends, you do know these people, and they they are in fact uh, dissimilar to you. So, all right, this is a very simple study, really, and it just said, are we friends with people with a similar mind? Yes. I think we knew this to be true anyway, but here's the neuroscience evidence that uh, if this is compelling to you, that, that, that there's something real here that's going on. And now the question is, okay, but why would this be true? Why would friends have brains that move similarly in the world um, than other people? And one potential explanation would be that we just go around and we locate the people whose brains work the same way we do. Like We befriend like-minded people. So we are a certain way, maybe we're just born a certain way, and we just find the people who are like us, and we just sort of grab hold of them, and those are our friends. So do we have evidence for this? Well, we do. We actually just, this is my the first talk I'm talking about this data, so that's very exciting. We got it back within the last week. So this is collected pre-pandemic, but it took a long time to get to it. Um, what we did was we took people as they came off the Dartmouth coach before they got to Tuck. So they basically arrived in Hanover and we intercepted them before they met anybody else at the business school. And then we stuffed them in the magnet and we made them watch those things. Okay. And then we sort of just locked that down. We have, we have a library of their brain activity and they haven't met each other yet. Then we waited. And we waited and we waited and we waited several months and then we had them do the friendship nominator to see who became friends with whom. And actually we did it at two different time points. We did it uh, a, a couple months in and then several more months sort of at the end of their first year. Okay. And here's what we found. All right. We found, and I'll unpack what this means, that the brain activity before they ever met each other, can be used to predict who they become friends with. This is not perfect, but here are the people who eventually become friends, social distance equals one, 
This is what their brain looked like before they knew each other. These are people who became friends of friends, and these are people who became friends of friends of friends. If anything, it's stronger over here, um, which I, I find so fascinating. It's like you find out who you really don't want to be friends with, you know, and you kind of push them out, right? Um, so uh, you can just say, we all have like Christmas card friends or but, like people who you want to kind of lurk on Facebook, you want to see how they're doing, but they're, they're, they're good where they are, right? Um, and then other people you kind of invite closer to you. Um, so we've just got this result. So it suggests that uh, there is something to being a certain way and finding your tribe. Now, interestingly, the effect gets stronger the more time people have to get to know each other. So in the first couple of months at the business school, um, there are friendships of convenience, to lack of a better term. Like you, you become friends with people, like somebody who's willing to go to dinner with you and you don't know anybody and you end up being friends with them for a while, but then you meet someone that's better, frankly, right? In terms of what you sort of resonate with and, and find fun. And so, if anything, the, the effect gets stronger over time. So by the end of the first year, um, you've sort of weeded out the people that you were originally friends with, but they're not as fun as you once thought they were or what have you. And so this is showing that your brain activity before you met each other is really predictive of the people. Once you get to know the social network, who you end up identifying as your friends. Okay. So this result, right, is is... I think pretty clear that there's something about we befriend like-minded others, that we carry the, these brains around and we find people whose brains work like ours. And that determines, at least in part, who we're friends with. Okay. The other alternative, of course, and these aren't mutually exclusive, so this is definitely true, but the, the alternative is that we become more similar through shared experiences. That the hope is that you're, you're thrown together with someone in a, as a dorm roommate and undergrad, and you never would have naturally become friends with this person probably, but you get to know each other and you become friends, right? That, that it might be something to this idea that we actually sort of rub off of each other and, and change and grow and become friends that way. And we have some evidence that this is true too. All right, so this is work done with Bo Sievers, um, who's a postdoc with Josh Green, and uh, Uri Hassan at Princeton, and Adam again, and Chris is about to move on. And in this study, people are watching movie clips, but unlike the first study, these ones are really odd. So they're, the sound is off, it, they're taken from the middle of movies, you don't really know what's going on. So people clearly have relationships with each other, but it's it's ambiguous what's going on. I'm gonna show you just a very short, so you kind of get a sense of what these kind of things look like. So I don't know who was controlling the lights before, but that was that was excellent. Thanks, Jen. Okay. So what's going on there? Uh, who's what's this Nicole Kidman character doing? What's the weird kid in the hallway? What's that about? Right? You don't know. You're just watching these things, and that's the first session in the scanner. And then after the scanning session, we ask them like, "What was going on with that weird kid in the hallway?" And they write down what they thought was going on. Then this is where it gets interesting: is they have to get together with other people, groups of around five. And they have to come to some consensus about what they thought was going on. So they all came up with their own idiosyncratic interpretations, and then they kind of hash them out and go, who has the better idea? What are we going to agree is the right way to think about this? Which, by the way, was that the kid in the hallway was like Nicole Kidman's ex-husband reincarnated as a child. No one comes up with that interpretation, <laughs> but that is the correct interpretation. Okay. Then... They go back in the scanner, obviously as individuals, and they see those clips again. 
Um, and they also see uh, clips from further along in the movie. So it's same characters, but they've never seen them before, never obviously discussed them before. Okay. So here's what we're looking for. We call these change maps. What we're looking for is whether the groups come into alignment based on the conversation. So they've now, they're seeing these clips again through the lens of the group conversation they just had. And that conversation has given them a way to think about uh, the things that they saw. Um, does that actually change brands? Are they actually really seeing these things again now through the lens of the group? And so what we can do is just very simply take the intersubject correlation after for you know, session two and or session three, right, and subtract out what it, how similar people were before, that are people coming more aligned? And what we find is that conversation indeed synchronizes brain activity within groups. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna grab a, a cluster from one group and just kind of illustrate the effect here. Okay, so what we see here is this is a time series I wonder whose ringtone that is. Sorry, okay. Time to take my eye drops. <laughs> I'll wait till after your talk. Sorry. Uh, so this is a this is a time series before conversation. Each of these lines is there's different color. I don't know if you can see that. And there are different people in the group, and there are, it's just sort of all over the place. This very uh, uncorrelated, um, as you can see. And then what we see over and over again across the brain is the time series um, within a group becomes much tighter, right? This is the time series after conversation. So there really are seeing these clips now through the lens of the group and there's, it's sort of funneling through that interpretation and they're seeing it the same way. And you can actually um, look at the change in the intersubject correlation and figure out, well, when do sometimes groups uh, change from being like, 100, you know, 100 percent uncorrelated, zero percent correlated to like 0.8. Right, something about the conversation just fundamentally changed how the group saw uh, those clips, such that they all saw it the same way. And you can, you know, start to look at well, where do you get these sort of peaks, and then map them back onto these clips. And what you can see is that uh, uh, here, there, uh, that that's relating to when the the pivotal scene when the child sort of sinks to his knees. So something about the group's conversation steered them toward using a certain cognitive process at that moment, um, and they're all doing that. Now, importantly, there's no like alignment area in the brain, right? It's not like, oh, the alignment area switched on for this group. No, a different, the, the better way to think about it is, here's, here's one movie, so that same movie with the, with the kid that sinks to his knees, and these are the areas for this one group that came into alignment, became more correlated, more synchronized post-conversation than before. And it's different depending on the group, right? Because the interpretation of each group is completely different. So they're aligning in different ways, and it's the content of the conversation that's doing the work. And you can also look at what, you know, a single group, um, but depending on the movie that they've talked about, they come into alignment differently. Different movies require different interpretations, different patterns of alignment. Okay. We also see this increased synchrony um, between group members persist for novel clips. So these clips were never discussed. It's not just, also we have a lot of control conditions where you don't get this effect just from seeing the same movie twice, for example. It requires conversation. That conversation changes uh, the synchrony of the groups going forward in time when they're seeing new information. So they've now decided to how to think about the characters in a certain way. And now when they see those characters in new clips, their brains are more aligned than other sort of pseudo, pseudo pairs you can create. So do we become more similar through shared experiences? Yes, also, right? Which is, uh, I think, a really nice way to think about um, how friendship forms, uh, that we have, we have both uh, strategies available to us. So we can um, just naturally 
gravitate towards people who think like us. I think that is just part of who we are. And I think we can talk in maybe in the Q&A about why that might be true, but I think it's metabolically more efficient to talk to people who have a similar shared view, right? It's it certainly, if you think about the conversations that you have with your friends, they're presumably effortless and fun. And you don't have to overthink things, right? So there's a sort of a natural tendency to try to find people like that. That's rewarding. That's what, that's the stuff of friendship. That's what makes it great. But also that through conversation, through shared experiences, we can become more similar, that that is a route available to us too. And I think that's actually the more hopeful route for society is that we can in fact be with people who maybe have a different starting position um, and, and that's okay. So the way I think about conversation is uh, like this. This is a, just a metaphoric, if you will, but I think it's, it's good. Um, this is a bunch of metronomes all starting at different parts of their cycle. This is actually Uri and he's gonna put the metronomes on these cylinders. Right. And these cylinders, because they move, it allows the metronomes to provide feedback, talk, if you will, to each other. Okay. So I think the general idea here is that um, feedback creates alignment and that we can extend the metaphor to conversation as providing a platform where minds meet and provide feedback to each other. I think conversation is neurofeedback. It is like me getting into you know, Mike's mind and getting his mind to react in a certain way and, and, and sort of and seeing whether that my anticipated effects actually hold and, and vice versa, right? That it, it is how we create alignment. Like conversation is the ecological niche of language and it's how we create alignment in another brain, um, mutually adapting patterns of thought um, and thereby forging shared mental models or shared ways of thinking about the world. So in summary, um, what I've shown you today is that friends think alike in case you didn't know that already, right? But we can see it in brain activity, right? We can actually show that friends have more similar neural patterns than people who are friends of friends who also have more similar patterns than people who are friends of friends of friends. These pre-existing uh, alignments predict future friendships. So I think a certain way, I'm gonna to gravitate towards people who think the same way I do and become friends with them. You know, we can talk about whether that's a good thing or not such a good thing. But that's definitely the way it is. And alignment can also be created through conversation, that there is something um, useful about conversation that really does change people's uh, minds and aligns brains. And I think, um, you know, this makes me think of, uh, maybe this is happening in, in your brain too, as in Sharon's class this morning, and a, a student question, so how does this relate to politics, and I think um, our natural inclination to find people who think like we do, right, is just amplified in this crazy way by social media. Right? We can now just select on very narrow niche ways of thinking and find people uh, to be friends with. And this, of course, obviously uh, has real problems for creating these big, uh, divides, um, tribalism. And uh, that's our natural inclination is to do this. And the hope is, right, is, is like the people here, right, are our best hope. Um, and, that, and that conversation, and I think especially face-to-face -face conversation, really can help uh, ameliorate the, this sort of natural tendency to just sort of dig in and, and create these little echo chamber bubbles. But if we can actually talk with the people who are not maybe perfectly aligned with us, like I'm not asking you to 
befriend, like if you're a Biden person, befriend a Trump person necessarily. Like great if you all power to you, but if you can just make sure that the people, like some of your friends don't exactly think exactly like you do um, so that you get different inputs. And I think that's the way to innovation, creativity, and personal growth. So friendship is a great thing, but also getting people on the same page or getting or uh, negotiating that together in the collective um, from different starting positions is also a beautiful thing. Thank you. I'd love to uh, answer any questions about this work. We'll let you. We'll let you choose the. Question. Oh, great. Okay. Anyone? Yeah, in the back. Oh, Emily. Hi. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and whether there's too, is just a bridge too far, right, or whatever. Um, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I mean, in the in the study with Bo, where people are kind of uh, coming to a consensus about the movie clips. I mean, this is like as low stakes as it gets, right? I mean, okay, we have different interpretations, but we're not. There's no identity, right? wedded to any of these interpretations. And so people can have a real frank sort of discussion and hopefully sort of check their ego or whatever and come up with a, a good answer. But whether, you know, if we have people who are starting from a far apart, um, how does that work? Um, if they have different opinions that they care about, you know, uh, like I would love to use this kind of technique to see how open people are and what the limits are of um, and how willing people are to really listen to another person. In, in our study, you know, why wouldn't you listen to another person? But in another situation, that might change. Sure. That was really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, I had a question. Just, sorry, one second. We want to make sure that folks at home, folks listening uh, on YouTube, can also hear the questions. And is this the, not working? No, 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 no but but you can hear the, the question. Okay. I'll repeat the question. Thank so, you. Yes, thank you. Just to get to the main point. Okay. Repeat the question, please. Okay. Um, so my question is, how does the um, neural alignment for predicting friendship can that compare with behavioral or self-report measures, if you measure that? Yeah. Uh, we would, yeah, that was a reviewer's point. Um, we do need a $3 million machine. Could you just ask people, do you find this funny? Uh, and we do beat the self-report, the, the neural uh, similarity. Um, but yeah, you could get, there's, obviously you could get some purchase on asking people, you know, do you find this funny? Do you find this interesting? Are you a Democrat? Or you know, that, that sort of thing. That, I mean, those demographics really matter, those that come out on a survey. But if you look at, um, I've been talking to some friends of mine who study uh, romantic relationships. And if you look at Mash.com and eHarmony and I'm trying to think of who, Bumble and OkCupid, like they haven't found any questions that predict uh, whether people will want to go on a second date. You, you can predict whether somebody will click on someone by whether or not they like beer and whether or not they like horror movies. 
but even then, you, you can't, you have, there's no predictive power to whether or not they enjoyed themselves if they went out with each other. Um, and there's one other question. There's, uh, do you find the thought of an apocalypse kind of exciting? <laughs> <laughs> Has a little bit of, again, getting you to the first date, but not, but doesn't, like this idea of sort of clicking in chemistry, I think is beyond the surveys. Sorry, just to, um, just to follow up, are you saying that the neural measures alone did better than on some support measures, or that it just added incremental value? Um, I believe, I have to go back to the paper, but I believe it was significantly better. But I don't, I would have to go back to that paper. Thank you. I just remember, I didn't repeat the question. Okay. I have a question from a YouTube viewer at home, Dan Romer. He said, what about people who dislike each other? Are their time series inversely related? We haven't, we haven't looked at that. Although, I mean, if you think about, I think one thing that's interesting about our findings is, is it's not just that friends are remarkably similar, is that people who are dissimilar repel each other over time. So there's, I think that's, there's something to that. Now, how you dislike someone, I think is interesting. Um, like in Sharon's class, a student raised the idea of frenemies or whatever. It's like people you would nominate as friends, but you don't wish them well, right? Uh, like where do those fit in this graph? And I, and I don't know. Yes. Um, thanks again for your talk. I really enjoyed learning about your work. Um, I had a question about surface level conversation versus deep conversation. Yeah. So just to kind of piggyback on what you're just saying, you know, I had a friend who I thought we were really close and compatible. Um, but over the last year, we started to talk a little bit more deeply about things that we really care about. And we learned that we're actually very dissimilar. What we realized was, you know, we were connected by two pretty surface level things, being like intramural sports or, you know, video games or something. But once you start to spend more time with people, you know, you learn a bit more deeply. And, um, I yeah. guess I just want to know, is there some sort of predictor about how compatible people will be um, if they're using surface level conversation versus deep conversation? Uh, I don't know, but I will say we have a whole line of work that's behavioral work um, on where people start in conversation. So when people, when you bring two strangers, two undergraduates, say, into the lab, They'll talk about what classes they're taking. And there's like three, there are basically three things they'll talk about. Sports, weather, classes. <laughs> and it's like, and we figured out that the reason for that is that those are the topics that have the most exit ramps. They're like, if you just start there, there's a possibility to go somewhere interesting. But you got to start there to find it. It's like starting in the lobby of a hotel. Right? And there are lots of different ways to where places to go, but you can't just agree to meet in room 318B or something, right? You've got to find it from the lobby. Um, and that's what strangers seem to do. And they start in this sort of surface things and kind of feel each other out and see if they can bounce to a more interesting uh, place. And so strangers do start shallow. Like I was talking to Paul Bloom about this. And he's like, yeah, why don't people just start with, like, would you ever kill your mother? That's way more interesting. <laughs> Nobody cares about the weather, right? Um, but people don't do that because it's weird. And, you know, you're in this very niche space that you might not want to be in, right? It's risky. Um, but friends can start in a much different, like, they don't start in the weather, right? So when you've, when you've transitioned into real friendship, you start in another room of the hotel, right? You don't start in the lobby. So. Um, but what you found was that you were fine in the lobby, right? That we can do this. We were like, it's like, it's like, it's like improvised jazz. It's like, okay, if you got three chords, you can kind of do, or blues or something, you can kind of do the basic thing. Yeah. But then you try to do something interesting, and if somebody can't follow you, and that's what happened with the deep conversation, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, but that's, yeah. That, that's important to know, right? Yeah. And that limits your friendship. It does, and it's actually uh, driven me to pursue deeper connection and be less interested in sort of a surface level cocktail party conversation yeah. and things like that. 
Uh, unusual, I, I like this a lot because you're using the neural data in a different way than a typical neuropsychologist. Study, but you're using it to measure something about people's relationship, which you can't really measure behavior. I mean, how do you measure synchronization? It's a little tricky. Mm -hmm. Though I think it, you could do it physiologically with blood pressure and all that sort of stuff. But this is really interesting. We don't have a good way of measuring how synchronized people are. And you've got one by using the nervous system. So it's a little different from seeing something in the behavior and finding out how you can measure it okay. in the nervous system. This is using the nervous system to measure something interesting psychologically, which we have trouble measuring psychologically. Thank so you. I think that's an interesting turn on the usual thing. Thanks. I agree. Uh, in the back. Um, I actually had one thing you all back off of that surface level um, like interaction. Yes. I was actually wondering um, your views on like online friendships and how sometimes they form those deeper connections. But when you get that um, time to finally like meet up, you're like, oh, it's like meet up and actually talk in person. Like why it seems to be a little awkward and like stand off. I don't know. So sorry, the question was. I'll do this for, for once. Um, uh, if I'm getting this right, is that online conversations you can kind of form a connection over online, but then when you meet in person, it might be discomforting. Yeah. Um, I don't know why that's true. Often I feel like online actually loses, it's hard to connect even with a close friend online. Um, and you're Suggesting it goes the other way too. Uh, you know, it's a we don't really know, but there's clearly differences between face-to-face -face interaction and online interaction. Right? There's, I mean, there's so many more. Face-to-face -face is so much richer, right? And you've got um, shared environments that you can. Usually, that helps scaffold a conversation. What you're saying is you got used to this one kind of environment. And now, together, it's awkward, right, in, in, in person. That's interesting. I hadn't really thought about it going the other way, that it becomes awkward when you're, you know, in this multi-sensory kind of environment where you've got now all the nonverbals. And maybe if you got used to interacting in this very specific way. Um, but I don't know why that is. But I'm very interested in the differences between online and uh, in-person interaction. Yes. Um, I have a quick question. I had conversations with my peers who have indicated that um, converging senses of humor is oftentimes a marker for them to feel be compatible with somebody, and that's a, how they tell if they're going to be friends with somebody. Whereas diverging in extracurricular or academic interests is far less of a deal breaker for them. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, along that line, if you've noticed any sort of increased neural alignment when like, into the type of video that we're showing. Yeah. I ha so the, the question is whether uh, you see more neural alignment between friends for certain kinds of stimuli like comedy. Um, you know, you see a nature video, you don't share this, who cares? But, <laughs> but I want someone to laugh at the right places, the right jokes, right. And I had exactly the same intuition as you have that, I mean, the reason why we show people politics, comedy, uh, music videos, nature, science, was because I thought they wouldn't all work, right? And and my money was on comedy, right? Whether, are you a slapstick person or are you a mockumentary, dry, British humor kind of person? Um, and what we found was it didn't matter what we looked at. We got the same effect. And it there wasn't a boost for the comedy, for example, which is what I thought would happen. So we didn't see evidence for any differentiation. Now, not, not to say it's not there, but in terms of our tools, we didn't see it. Yes. Um, I was just wondering about children's friendships. So a lot of the times we see children in the form of that are really emotional, or mm. just, you know, out of the circumstances that they're in, who will close to somebody or trust a friend. So I'm just sort of wondering, like, is there a way to predict like, how likely So, does, I guess, early friendships 
um, strengthen the possibility for the future. Um, I, I have no idea. The question is whether uh, early friendship, like um, childhood friendship, uh, stays throughout your life or whether you, you're you're both sort of on a developmental, like there's gonna be all sorts of different paths that you take. Um, I'm not I'm not sure, I mean, we, equally interesting, I think, is um, people in older age, whether those friendships are enduring because you're less likely to change maybe, um, that you sort of know yourself uh, and your, your friends are just your friends. Um, and I, I don't know. Uh, I don't. I. I don't know the answer to that. Um, the sort of the how in flux friendships are. I think it probably has to map on to the lifespan in some way. Um, but what makes people enduring friends since like elementary school? I don't. I don't know. It's, it's a great question. I. I don't have any data on that. Yeah, in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, actually, what we found um, with that conversation data that I showed, uh, one one detail that uh, for the sake of time I didn't go into. So the question is as uh, whether um, some people have like an outsized role on influencing this sort of alignment. Um, you know, stronger uh, aligners than others, and. Uh, we actually engineered the groups from that uh, Tuck Business School. So we knew that in each group, how much people were social hubs versus on the periphery of their social network um, and, and various metrics. And what we found was that the people who are highly central in their networks that had a lot of influence in the network because of them being well-connected to well-connected others, for example, they created more alignment in their groups than other people. So for every word, they didn't speak more than other people, but for every word they spoke, their group came into alignment more. Um, and so that's, we find that sort of interesting, that some people are just better at creating consensus. They're rallying other minds, say, this is what we should uh, uh, believe, right? And so, yeah, it's not evenly distributed in the population. There are some people who are better at this than others. Yes, Sharon? So when I first um, learned that you were doing this research with Dartmouth and becoming MBA students, um, you know, my first thought was like, wow, it's amazing that uh, you get enough variability across people to you know, pick up the signal. Um, I mean, I'm sure Dartmouth wants to boast about the diversity of their student population, but nonetheless, these are all incoming MBA students <laughs> who are willing to live in an isolated small town, right? Yes. So they are way, they already have way more in common with one another than, for example, sure. Carolyn Parkinson's now moved to LA. If, if she were to, to grab you know people uh, you know from LA, so right. at first I was like amazing to find it, but when I was revisiting that idea, uh, you know, for my uh, thinking about my class today, I was thinking, well, maybe that's amplifying the effect you're seeing because what's predicting friendship from you know what you attend to in movies of people who already have so much in common are going to be these these little things like whether I like America's Funniest Videos or whether I like who that is, right? Hmm. Um, whereas you know whether or not you want to be a get an MBA and you want to live in a small town, like those sorts of things, like that you wouldn't see from tracking the video. It, and might not be temporally synchronized in the way that you need temporal synchronization. So if you were to take a 
group of people who have much less in common, um, mm. I, I wonder whether it actually would diminish your ability to get the effects from this like short term temporal synchronization kind of stuff, of, like what things you find funny or what things you grab your attention. Do you do you have any thoughts on that? On, on like how you, how you might try to look at whether the effects go up or go down? And I'm really sorry you have to repeat this question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> this is like generalized to a more diverse sample. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Do my do my results uh, generalized? If if I look to some some a more diverse sample than MBA students, I mean, obviously, I don't know for sure the answer to that because I haven't looked um, beyond MBA students. I will say, um, I mean, I think you might be right that they might not, or it, the effect might be stronger because there's some. Similarity. Now, of course, we're capitalizing on individual variation within that similarity, right? I mean, uh, so we need, in fact, the, the clips were, were all picked to be differentiating, that would differentiate people. What we didn't want was everybody seeing something that just everybody saw exactly the same way, because how else could you uh, see it, right? We wanted things that would be, would just separate people, right? Um, and so there was enough individual variation in the population to see the effect. Now, would there be, was there sort of a sweet spot that they were similar enough, but also dissimilar enough? I, and I, I don't know the answer to that. I will say that Dartmouth, surprisingly, is, I mean, they're all business students, but 40% are international. And we actually have another data set that um, shows that uh, uh, for those international students, um, where they come from, what country they come from, and the diversity of the country that they come from, based on 500 years of migration data, the diversity of the country they come from really predicts who they become friends with when they come to talk. So people who come from uh, very non-diverse in terms of not having migration in that country, like China, Norway, um, those people tend to or friend people who are also from those countries or, or very, very small um, social network. People from Brazil, Canada, places that have had a lots of migration history connect broadly in the network. They become these brokers, they become friends with all sorts of different people from different walks of life. And we also found that that also replicates at the county level for the US students. The US students that are coming to talk from DC, from New York, from places that have a lot of Facebook ties in, in, internationally, those people befriend all sorts of people broadly in the network. Whereas the people that come from counties in the US that have very few international Facebook ties, um, they're very sort of insular, they, they tend to be more insular when they come to talk. So there's some you know, they are all MBA students, but I don't think that it's sort of this monolithic group. Yes. Um, so I, I think you probably showed the data that would answer this question, but I wasn't thinking of it at the time. So I'm going to have to ask you to repeat what might have been up there. Um, I would expect um, that certain parts of the like synchrony in certain parts of the brain would be much more predictive than mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. Of course, the reason we do research is because what you expect isn't always what you find. But um, I mean, is it true that maybe, you know, sort of limbic areas, you know, amygdala and insula and reward system, mm -hmm. that um, similar responses in those are more predictive of who you want to spend time with, then I don't know, you know, sort of uh, working memory and you know, lateral frontal. Yeah, I mean, we, so the question is whether or not certain parts of the brain or certain systems or circuits in the brain will be more predictive of friendship than others. And um, we certainly went in thinking that would be true. And didn't really see a lot of evidence for it. I mean, I think what what we see is just, you know, when you have an, when you start to see a scene in a particular way, it changes everything about how you attend to that scene. So we get we get visual stuff, we get dorsal attention network stuff, right? Because the interpretation is not just emotional or not just social thing. It's like it's how you take in information 
And so even sensory maps are coming into alignment that maybe we were surprised, like, V1, really? Right? Yes, V1, because you're attending to the scene differently, right? And so we didn't see that uh, that sort of variation at the level of those sort of circuits. But um, not that those aren't important, and it, and, it, and it may be a different kind of analysis that would, that would pull those out. Sure. Let's do a couple more questions. Okay. Um, Paul, and then I'll go to this, you in the back. This is not about friendship, but it's about your technique. Um, it seems to me if you had two people who like Mozart, maybe listening to the same piece of Mozart at the same time, yes, you get a fair amount of synchrony. That's right. If you took two people who didn't know anything about Mozart, listening to the same pieces, you wouldn't get much synchrony. My guess. So this might be a way of getting again something interesting about what parts of the brain are involved, and maybe even what concepts are involved in this in making sense of. A, of a stimulus in this case, Mozart, by looking at what whether people synchronize and where again, what Martha was saying, where they synchronize in the brain, because you can't do this otherwise. It's a technique that hmm. you know we, we couldn't look at one brain and get any of this information, but by doing it your way, we can see something about what's in, what are people who like Mozart who like classical music can have in common. Yes, in terms of their processing this information, I think that's. A really potentially very valuable line of work. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, Can I just bring you to every time? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> and another thing why this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. Oh, what are my plans for the future? Um, well, I want to know what's going on uh, here. Like, what I've showed you is, like, the before and after. The magic is happening in the middle, right, where people are actually adapting, changing to each other. And I want to understand how that works. That's where my focus is now. Like, we're doing um, two people and two fMRI talking to each other, trying to try to mathematically describe, which is going to go beyond synchrony, um, how brains couple with each other such that they fundamentally alter the patterns and create um, maybe even something that is irreducible to the individuals alone. So that's what that's where I'm I'm moving is is going beyond sort of pre post and looking at what is it we get out what are, what does our brains get out of this thing we call conversation that we do it all the time, that we're in and out of conversation multiple times a day. I think, you know, when we, uh, when we can't do it, when we're isolated, we get weird. Um, there's model drift. Solitary confinement is considered torture by many countries in the world because our brains don't work right if we're not in communication with each other. So I want to understand what is it about conversation that keeps our brains sane that allows us to get this feedback that enables us to figure out what the structure of the social world is and sort of um, resonate with each other in a way that keeps us healthy. And so, yeah, I want to know what's going on there. And none of what I showed you today looks at that at all, but that's where I'm moving. Well, let us thank Now, before you all run off, I have to say that this year, because of COVID guidelines,